Welcome to another edition of Ion Education. I'm your host, Ed Licious, and joining us today is the Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Mero Andrade. Dr. Andrade, welcome, or welcome back. Yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure to be back. The last time we talked uh, was a couple of weeks into the new school year, and here we are in the month of December, and uh, things are moving quickly. They are, very, very quickly. So uh, on the overall picture of things, how, uh, how is the school year going so far? Excellent. I think at the beginning of the school year, we had a, a, a slight transportation issue that we overcome, and I think we're at a much better place. But really, um, over the last three months, one of our goals has been really improving our Tier 1 instruction. I've been in all of our schools over the course of the year in multiple classrooms, and I'm really impressed with the quality of teaching and learning going on, um, especially um, teaching and having high expectations around um, grade level expectations and moving our tier one systems forward. So really impressed on the, the level of expertise, knowledge and skills of our teachers, our paraeducators, um, pr providing high quality instruction to engage our students. So it's been a great, great school year. At the and of course, the exciting part of the start of the new school year was the opening of the Brian McCarthy Middle School. Yeah. And uh, by all accounts, uh, it's being well received by teachers, students, and parents. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and sometimes just a new building creates a new culture. So I've been in there several times um, over the course of the year. And just the, the way the building was constructed, the, the natural light, the, the configuration of the classrooms, the configuration of the hallways has been really conducive in, in engaging kids. The natural light, it's bright. People are happy. Um, you can see smile on people's faces. Um, at Elm Street was a huge building, uh, which allowed for a lot of walking around. Um, but the way McCarthy is, is um, constructed, uh, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade team is in one section of the building. And in those learning commons, um, students may be out in the hallways, but they're still always in visible sight of the teacher. So there's room for independent group work, uh, independent work, group work, um, students who just want to take a, a break and, and learn by themselves are in that same vicinity. In other schools, whether it's north, south, you know, you ask, right. a kid asks to go into the hallways, like you might not see them. <laughs> Even the bathrooms, right, at Makati are right around the corner. So we actually seen uh, uh, really a decrease in, in students walking around, uh, wandering, um, which level, like lowers the level of, of behaviors that might be happening, right, or, um, or unintended interactions right. between kids, right? So, so we've seen a decrease in uh, behaviors at, at McCarthy, which leads to increase in student uh, achievement. So we've seen our attendance rate is um, increased. Um, discipline obviously has gone down. But just looking at our beginning of year data, we're actually seeing students actually performing really well. So I think that has to do a lot with the, the learning environment. Um, and again, that culture that our teachers, our paraeducators, our secretaries, our administrators kind of create. So it's been a great culture over there. And one of the unique things about the <coughs> new uh, school, McCarthy, is a wing there has been dedicated to the special ed, special yeah. needs uh, population. How has that worked out? Because yeah. I know some people were concerned about mixing them too, but how's that gone? Yeah, uh, it's in um, year one, so our, it's not at full, <coughs> excuse me, full capacity, so not all, all of our students are um, in that program yet, especially students who are out of district. Um, some of it was to bring some students back. Um, so it's going <laughs> really well. Again, our, our adults, our uh, teachers at McCarthy have been really receptive and accepting a lot of the students with intensive special needs into their classroom, so in, with inclusion. Um, in full transparency, we still have a staffing issue. You know, we still need more um, intensive needs and district-wide paraeducators in those classrooms, so um, we're always looking for that kind of continuous Im improvement over there, but again, um, that wing, the, the level of inclusion, the level of supports we're able to provide the students has been really, really beneficial. Overall, uh, I know at the beginning of the year there was a need for some paras and uh, EEL teachers. Uh, 
How, how are things looking at this point in the school year? Yeah, so we're always looking for a district-wide instructional para educators. Um, it's just a, we always want to maximize the support of our students. Um, and I know it's been in the news uh, or in the community about working with the NTU on MOUs, a memorandum of understanding uh, about our intensive needs special education classrooms and our para educators. Um, so we're still working on um, how to finalize a MOU and so that we can not only um, retain our very professional skilled paraeducators, but also how do we recruit new uh, paraeducators into the district. One of the things that we're really trying to define is what is the appropriate levels of services? What's a ratio, right? Is, is so, or should there be a ratio um, when we're talking about special education students? Mm -hmm. um, I strongly feel that if it's about special education students and it's an IEP, it's individualized. So there may or may not be a right ratio, but it really should be student driven. So what is the data telling us that we actually is the right level of support of how many paraeducators we need in a classroom based on student need as opposed to a formula? And I think that's uh, a, a, a great conversation that we're starting to have really what is the student need as opposed to an adult, uh, to kind of air quotes here, right? right. Uh, uh, an adult ratio that we came up with um, to say what's the appropriate staffing. So uh, it, it's been a, a good kind of conversation and really want to go back to what's, what are the really should be driving that conversation, student needs, and then what is the data telling us? And so that's uh, a lot of the conversations that we're having that may or may may or may not lead to how many openings do we truly need. So. And, and, and it takes time to develop yep. that uh, with, yep. with them all in the, the same area pretty much now yep. to, to see uh, because when they were individualized at other schools yep. in the district, they were probably well taken yep. care of, but now they're all together. Yeah, I mean, it, there's two ways to look at it. One of the aspects at McCarthy was do you have the economy of scale? So mm -hmm. sometimes when you're stretched between three middle schools, you, you need three times the services. Now if you actually start combining some of the services, do you have better economy of scale so that um, a speech and language pathologist or a school psychologist isn't too stretched then? If they're only going to one location, you actually might maximize our resources. So that's a good kind of conversation. And again, I think even at our intensive needs <coughs> classrooms across the, the elementary schools, our intensive needs classrooms are across six buildings. Um, and so again, are we stretching our resources too thin? Um, and are there other ways to um, consolidate or maximize um, the level of supports that these students need? Uh, for people who may be watching us today, uh, what are the qualifications for someone to be a para? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's usually a high school, college um, uh, degree, um, and there's the, um, uh, I'm blanking on this specific uh, one, sorry about that, uh, but it's on our website on just what's the minimum on um, yeah, the prereqs. Right. Um, but it's, what's changed in the past is, you know, if you wanted to be a paraeducator 20 years ago, um, whether it's an instructional paraeducator or a district-wide paraeducator, a lot of it was about help, right? It was like around um, help in the academic area. What we're seeing in the last five years is that the intensity of the students' needs, whether it's social-emotional learning, behavior, or even reading and writing, uh, reading and, and math, has been much more intensive. And so what we were looking for in a paraeducator 20 years ago about the guiding a student, helping with transitions, um, what we're seeing a lot more now is that students are having, again, um, uh, anxiety issues, social emotional issues, um, mental illness issues. So we'll actually get into conversations to our district-wide paras need better training from the, from the district and what does that look like um, around behavior technicians or, or in that, that field. Um, so it's no longer just about 
are you able to help a student with math and reading, but now can you actually help students around um, be implementing behavior plans and changing um, their behaviors? Where are we with the ELL program in terms of uh, meeting the uh, the uh, order from the court? Yeah, we're making progress. Um, we're, we're, our latest task at the beginning of the year is um, we had to rescreen a lot of students um, who have been in the system for a number of years on their home language surveys. And so um, I, I'll use a perfect example for me. Um, first generation, my father's from Portugal. Um, so if I was enrolling in Nashua, um, they would ask for the languages spoken at home. And my father would mock off, he's from Portugal, speaks Portuguese, um, but I'm not, I, unfortunately, I, I, I wish, uh, I never spoke Portuguese. But I would be actually flagged as an ESL student because my father's native language is Portuguese. Um, so I would have to get screened. And so we're going through the process now of pulling every student pre-K through 12 on their registration packets to see how do they fill out their registration. And what we're, the, our ELL department's going through is if there was a student like me, I would have to get rescreened even though I enrolled in the school in third grade and I'm in an 11th grade. Okay. So, um, so we're doing a lot of that work and what we're figuring out or coming to light is that um, there may be more ELL students who are actually qualifying that actually the registration packet wasn't filled out. So um, it's gonna be interesting moving forward on how many more ELL teachers do we need um, and how do we provide those services. So, um, it, so it's, a, it's a, a good problem to have because I think, right, like it's like, how did we miss this in the screening mm -hmm. um, at the beginning? But now I think we'll be able to provide those services and then as we move forward, um, how many more ELL teachers do we need and how do we provide some of that ELL coaching for those students? And so, you'll have the data to back it up. And we'll so. have the data to back it up. So it's a, it's a good problem to have that at the end of the day, it's really about services to students and then um, the hot pot would be how do you fund it? How do you find more teachers? <laughs> You mentioned, uh, you know, we talked about McCarthy being the newest project, but there are two uh, elementary schools that are uh, in the throes right now of uh, some rehabbing and uh, remodeling. Yep. So Birch Hill and uh, Maine Dunstable Elementary Schools, for about a year now, have actually gone through major construction. Um, it, and it's really about um, improving air quality. One of the... Um, outcomes that's happening in improving the air quality is actually we took two open concept, concept schools that are now having closed classrooms. They look like two completely different schools and I really have to give a lot of credit to our um, construction partners Javi um, Harriman and EEI on really coming up with a great concept of what the schools would look like working side by side with the building principals um, but now when you work, walk into those two schools and you see their classrooms, again, similar to McCarthy, they're bright spaces, they picked great colors, the classrooms are, uh, they feel bigger than the open classroom, mm -hmm. which is ironic, right? Yeah. Um, the sound has been dampened. We increased some of the technology in, in those classrooms. So again, uh, students are thrilled. I think the, the teachers are, are thrilled as well. Um, but they feel like totally new places. And again, what I really want to look at is are our, our students feeling comfortable in that culture? And I think it's been transformational. Um, of course, back in the 70s, that was the, yeah, that the, was the, the way to go. I mean, the, the original yeah. Nashville High, where South is, was built open concept. Right, right. And then they started just slapping up yep. ceiling, yep. Uh, walls to ceilings and without making any adjustments in the air handling. And yeah. It causes a problem. Yep. So the... Um, so the project's going really well. They're actually ahead of schedule. Um, so I think we'll be, a, uh, they'll be finished up the projects a couple months um, um, before they, they truly expect it, so. Well, you mentioned the MOU with the uh, Paras and the Teachers Union. Uh, are there uh, any contract 
uh, up this year that uh, you'll be getting into the negotiations on? Yeah, we'll, we'll be uh, entering four uh, negotiations this year. Um, we have the teacher's contract, paraeducator's contract, um, ASME, which is our custodians and, and maintenance, um, as well as a new union that has formed, um, which, um, which is really, I think, a testament to our district. We have a sign language interpreter union. Yeah. So we run a, a K through 12 uh, signs of learning program, which is for the deaf and hard of hearing um, students. But there's enough adults in that, in that program supporting our students to form a union. Right? And so I, I really have to credit uh, the, the district providing those um, levels of support for those students. And then uh, again, th there's a new union coming from there. Um, a little different is um, it's it's a first contract, right? So how many like contracts right. have you been through or I been through, right? It's like the legacy, right? This contract has been in place for it seems like a hundred years. And it's like those tweaks, but we're actually in this one starting from scratch. So it's been interesting conversations on um, again education side for some of the um, the adults in in that union on you know what are the benefits of the union, right? And so really. Um, the union has been, the NTU has been doing a nice job educating um, those uh, adults on, again, what are the benefits of a union and, how, and what protections come from that. So it's been great. So it'll be a full plate this year. It's a full plate, yeah. yeah. And again, I think at the end of the day, we all want the, the same. We want retain and recruit the best educators and um, professionals, whether it's power educators, um, uh, custodians, maintenance, teachers. Um, we want the best adults in front of our kids and every single adult uh, makes a difference to the culture and, and the teaching and learning going on. So we want uh, contracts that are gonna recruit and retain uh, the very best in that affair. The school department's been in the news uh, of late uh, as the ones holding up the setting of the city's tax rate yeah. because you didn't get some form in on time. Uh, I have spoken to a longtime city official who said that the tax rate could have been set, that this form is required by the Department of Revenue because of the state funds that the uh, district gets. Uh, but uh, what's, what's behind all that? Yeah, um, so the form is called the DOE 25, um, and it's really about the revenue and expenses of, that came in over the, the last fiscal year. Um, the, the form is actually due September 1st, um, but the size of Nashua, and for years and years, we've always asked for a, a 30 or 60 day extension, just so that um, between the school department and the city that we're able to um, go through all the accounts, make sure everything ticks and ties and, and checks out. Um, this year, as we were going through a lot of the um, reports, um, we noticed that on our side, we had to do a little more cleaning. We actually had to hold a special um, BOE meeting to um, have the BOE uh, approve a recommendation from me on transferring f funds from um, a city account to the, to the school department so that we can actually balance our budget. Um, so that was a little of the delay, just really going through a lot of the, um, the lines um, the ESSA grants over the last couple of years made things a little more complicated. There was a lot of money that came in fast, and so again, we just wanted to make sure things were good. Um, we have submitted the DOE 25. It has been approved by the state. Um, so it, it's when um, we were in talks with the city and things going out, it was only a week or so um, after we actually submitted last year. So uh, I, I think it's just, again, where um, the timeline it, it just wasn't, again, we want things to be perfect. We want things to, to tie out. We don't want to um, forward any kind of reports that are inaccurate. So um, the city has been great partners with us. We've been in communication for the last um, two months on making sure that the report was going to be right. I can't say enough about the level of support that the, um, the city gives the school department, not only in the, the business department, but it, from my office as well. So unfortunately, the tax rate has been a little delayed, um, but you know, it, 
you know, there was things that had been cleaned up on the city side, uh, on the uh, school department side, that we really needed the, the city support for. And I think at this point, um, the city just had to clean up a couple of those lines as well um, for the uh, the report to be fully accepted by the state. So one of the one of the factors that people may not understand is that money that comes in from the state of New Hampshire for the school district doesn't go directly to the school district but to the city's general fund and then it could come over to you your budget could be reduced by a like amount so there are a lot of uh, uh, varying concepts yeah so um, like the bigger picture sometimes and it's not as clear right um, in Nashua is that we have uh, three main revenue sources right so we have uh, federal grants that come in we have state revenue uh, which in the form of adequacy aid or special education reimbursement and then uh, city appropriation. Um, what happens in Nashua is that uh, state adequacy aid or reimbursements go to, goes directly to the city. And so when I ask for a, a budget in the spring, um, I present my expenses and then when the city gives us our operating budget, the state revenue is actually baked into our operating budget. So just for not getting down to the penny, but right. just um, when I ask for um, our operating budget, it's approximately $130 million, give or take a couple million. I hate to, like, sounds horrible, right? <laughs> like, um, but it, it's around 125 to $130 million. And that's what I'm asking for the city. In that $130 million of uh, of, of my expenses and the revenue coming in, that state contribution will come in from the city as well. So, um, and that's sometimes not clear. Um, the other benefit, uh, again, working with the city, that's also sometimes not as transparent, is that when I'm asking for $130 million, that doesn't include benefits, right? So the city, again, having a great partnership with them, is that, you know, we're hearing, for example, for this year, that benefits in health care may be going up anywhere from 11 to 15 percent, mm. right? When I ask the mayor and the Board of Aldermen for $130 million, it doesn't include, include that. that, right? And so there's, again, I, I think, um, the unpacking of what goes into the budget. And so there's an aspect where, yes, revenue goes into the city, but the city is also taking on a huge burden on the school district on covering the benefit costs. In previous districts that I worked in, I would be asking for a 3% increase, right? And that's salary and benefits and all the other expenses, transportation, electricity. So if, if, if um, benefits went up 11%, right, into like the $1 kind of aspect of it, that means I'm, I would have to reduce in a different area going in and having conversations with the with the city i'm not asking for the 11 percent i'm only asking for three or four percent on the 130 which actually is a huge benefit to the school department and we're very fortunate to have that partnership yeah. and, on, and on a positive note stellus is on schedule it's on schedule a little ahead of schedule so um you know today is december 3rd 4th um, it may snow this week, right? And so as long as uh, we don't get uh, too much snow and it doesn't ice over, um, we should be ahead of schedule and students will be playing next spring. Great. Well, Dr. Andre, thank you for being with us. Happy holidays to you and your family Same and uh, keep up the good work. Same here. Thank you. Appreciate it. Our guest today has been the superintendent of schools, Dr. Mara Andre. You've been listening and watching Eye on Education. I'm your host, Ed Licious, and we'll see you next time.